Okay, I'm just uh, welcoming in those who are watching us uh, who are watching us uh, online. Um, we are uh, uh, we're in Parashat Ekev. Um, we're Parashat Ekev, and we're starting off with uh, Perek Chet, the eighth chapter, Pasuk Zayin, verse seven. So let's just get this in the in the wider context. So we are in the middle of Moshe Rabbeinu's speech, final speech, right? The, basically, the entire book is Moshe Rabbeinu's final speech um, before he passes away. Um, and in this speech, among other things, he is telling, he's basically going over the story of the events that took place throughout the desert, adding in his own perspective or interpretation. Um, of of the things as they happened, or in retrospect, and also giving them warnings and direction for um, for the time to come, for the time of entering the land of Israel, um, and when he's no longer there. So, just to get the context of the chapter, okay. Even though these these are not the verses we're going to be we're going to just to get because they really are beautiful chapter, beautiful verses. So let's just read them together a little bit. Um, let's let's start from the beginning of the chapter. Um, chapter eight, verse one: You shall faithfully observe all the instruction that I enjoin upon you today, that you may thrive and increase and be able to possess the land that the Lord promised an oath to your fathers. Remember the long way that Hashem, your God, has made you travel in the wilderness these past 40 years, that He might test you by hardship to learn what was in your hearts, whether you would keep His commandments or not. And these are verses that don't even need a midrash. They're just very, very, very powerful, very extensive. Verse 3, He subjected you to the hardship of hunger and then gave you manna to eat, which neither you nor your father had ever known, in order to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but that man may live on anything that the Lord decrees. Again, these the very power. It's actually interesting. The the midrash. There isn't that much midrash on these verses, which is very surprising. And I think that maybe there isn't that much midrash because the verses are very very clear on what they're trying to say. The clothes upon you did not wear out, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. Bear in mind that, the, that Hashem, your God, dis, uh, disciplines you just as a man disciplines his son. Such a, again, such a beautiful, beautiful phrasing. Bear in mind that, the, that Hashem, your God, disciplines you just as a man disciplines his son. And I don't usually speak in this way, but I can't help myself. If we actually took that at face value... That sentence. Bear in mind that Hashem your God disciplines you just as a man disciplines his son. Imagine if we were able to actually take that at face value. How much easier it would make our understanding of our relationship with Hashem, with God. If we actually believed that 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 God sees us as a child, and then when we suffer, it is as a father causes suffering. A father does, a parent sometimes does do things which a child experiences as suffering. But that's not the topic. I just couldn't help myself. We're getting close to our verses. Therefore keep the commandments of Hashem your God, walk in His ways, and revere Him. Here we go. Now we're at our verses. And these are the verses we're going to read, and we're going to ask questions on. For Hashem, your God, is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and springs and fountains issuing from plain and hill, a land of wheat and barley, of vines, figs, and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may, may eat food without stint, where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron, and from whose hills you can mine copper. When you have eaten your fill, give thanks to Hashem your God for the good land which He has given you. Okay, questions? About this, specifically about this 
strain this run of verses from verse seven to ten. I believe it, it is one of the few passages in which there is no threat except the consciousness that evil exists when it says if your consciousness is going to fail or you're going to forget, etc. So you're right. It's one of the most beautiful passages we can find in the Torah. Uh, okay, I, I agree. Yes? My question is around uh, passage 8. A land of wheat, barley, grape, but it's also oranges and uh, uh, you know we, we grow things it, wheat doesn't grow by itself and grapes well our pigs pomegranates like why those and uh, we have to plant that and we have to cultivate it we can plant other things so ah, excellent so you're saying what defines okay I, good question you're saying what defines this a land of wheat and and barley wheat and barley at least wheat and barley that can be used by man needs to be planted Right? Vineyards need to be planted and cared for. So if you plant, uh, you know, you know, like as you say, citrus, uh, as we know, if you plant citrus trees, then there'll be a land of citrus trees. So he's saying, what defines this as, what, what makes this a characteristic of the land? Okay, good. Yes. Okay, so what's the question? So, what's about the... Well, I, well, the look... The, the well, I, I'm not sure what's that those... The there, there are other things. There are other things that you could use um, iron and, uh, and, um, and copper for. Not only weapons. And, and... Why is that? Even if we were to come and say that uh, iron is going to be uh, mined for, uh, for weapons, why is it necessarily a bad thing? Meaning, they all know that when they enter the land, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to be conquering. They're, they're going to be wars. They're not being sold on a utopian situation where they're coming into a land and they have to do nothing. Quite the opposite. They're told numerous times that they're going to come into the land and it's going to be hard. They're going to have to fight wars. They're going to have to battle. They're going to have to work hard. So even if you're right, e even if you're right that the connotation of that it's um, rocks, are, rocks of iron and that that is a connotation of war, that's not necessarily a negative thing. And again, if they're going to... Uh, uh, Okay, what you say what you're saying is that it almost what you're saying is it almost seems contradictory. On the one hand, you're saying it's a land of uh that has all these things that grow, but on the other hand you have rocks of iron and nothing grows. If the rocks are iron, nothing grows. Okay, although it seems okay, I I hear it, but it it does sound to be first, don't worry. What? What about exactly? What about oil? What about gold and silver? What about diamond? So if you can, if you cannot produce something, you can buy it. You're saying, you know, you're saying, you saying why? why uh, no, that's actually an interesting question. Why iron and copper? Meaning, you know, gold is more uh, is more valuable than uh, than uh, than iron and copper. Um, you know, diamonds is even more valuable. Um, good question, I don't know. I Meaning why, you see, basically the question is, why is it that the land of Israel was not, cre which was destined to be the land of the Jewish people, why did God not create it as, uh, with, uh, to be, could to be plenty, plentiful with gold and diamonds? I don't know. Although maybe it has to do with what you said before, which is iron is more useful than gold. Yeah, Oleg? Yeah, 
isn't isn't it uh, this description contradictory to the uh, other description of the place where it says the water uh, the the rain rainfall depends on Hashem's will and uh, uh, the the land is barren uh, and it's basically dependent on the, on the prayer course. and we'll get there yeah. we'll 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 get there soon well. Okay, in uh, uh, two chapters from now, when we're done with the first Midrash that we're going to see, we're going to get to those verses, and then we'll compare and contrast. Okay, any, any other questions about the whole... Yes, but, but, uh, I understood something. I understood why, uh, why I like this passage. This passage is showing something very acute here. He says that if if you will know in your heart that the way a man treats his son, this is the way Hashem will treat you. And immediately after that, he says, because Hashem, your God, your God, is bringing you to a land that is so and so and so and so, and you have, you rest assured you are going to have the possession of a land that is going to give you the best the earth can produce. Right. So I think that I believe that these two uh, uh, came shows the way not only to remain, remind us the way Hashem need, he has to be seen as a father, as a good father, but also the fact that we humans may put a, may pay attention to the fact that we have all the resources, not only the physical of the land, that even when difficulties arrive and when, when, when problems are in front of us and disasters are in front of us, we have, we may we have, have, a, we have what we need. Resources. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a, 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 a um, fundamental point. Um, Can I ask? Yes. Why uh, God doesn't give us uh, fields, fields uh, full of grass for our animals? It looks like we are going to be vegetarian. We're going to be what? Vegetarian. That's right. Why not? Interesting. I mean, it's an idea, but not? nothing here about fields for the animals. It's only food uh, for people. For humans. Okay, interesting, interesting point. I want to jump forward because I want to get into the Midrash already because the Midrashim that, that I've chosen, I find them to be absolutely beautiful, stunning. Um, jump to chapter 11. Verse 8. And this is going to bring us to the verses that Oleg, that you were, were referring to. Chapter 11, verse 8. Someone, someone uh, what's the page? 993. Okay. Verse 8. Nine. Keep therefore all the instruction that I enjoin upon you today so that you may have the strength to enter and take possession of the land that you are about to cross into and possess. Next verse. And that you may long endure upon the soil that the Lord, that Hashem swore to your fathers to assign to them and their heirs. Here we go. A land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you are about to enter and possess it, it possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come. There the grain you sowed had to be watered by your own labors, like a vegetable garden. But the land you are about to cross into and possess, a land of hills and valleys, soaks up its water from the rains of heaven. It is a land which Hashem your God looks after, and which... Um, Hashem, your God, always keeps his eye from year's beginning to year's end. Any questions here? Or I would say even any questions about the combination of the verses we saw before and the verses we saw here. So Oleg, by the way, I don't think there's a contradiction. Not at all. Not at all. It's, it, it seems to be different features. It seems to be different features, additional features. But the history shows otherwise. So it says you will you will never uh, starve in that land. But didn't uh, Jews leave that land multiple times because of uh, famine? 
Yes. So there is a connection that's being made here, right? We saw, you look back in verse, uh, here, in verse 8, Keep therefore all the instruction that I enjoin upon you today, so that you may have the strength to enter and take possession of the land. And in other places, just like if we, if we were to continue, in verse uh, 13, right, it's parashat vahiyayim shama the second parsha of the Shema that goes and conditions the plentiness of the land of Israel on the collective behavior of the Jewish people. It, comes, it seems to be coming and saying, listen, the default of the land is that it's a great land, flowing with milk and honey, it's great this, it's great that, but you could ruin it. The default of the, meaning the character of the land is all these wonderful things. And if you, and, and if, and, and you're, that is the plan. You are supposed to enjoy all that. If you go and collectively corrupt yourself morally and um, stray from the moral and religious behaviors that are part of who you are, then there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship between the people and the land. And therefore, you could destroy the land. It's almost as if you had to come and say, listen, you come into a beautiful, beautiful garden that is naturally watered and is naturally has a perfect amount of sun, sunlight, and rainfall, and uh, you don't need to touch it. All you need to do is to not ruin it. So, and then a person goes and he builds, builds a, you know, builds a, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, builds a rooftop over the yard, so there's less, so the rain can't, can't, uh, the rain can't come as much, and he puts too much shade there, and the sun can't come as much, or a person starts running across, playing soccer, and, and, and he steps on the flowers, okay, the natural character of the land is wonderful, if you come and you destroy it, um, in the symbiotic way that exists between the people on the land, then yes, it will be destroyed. But okay, I want to go into the Midrash. The question that I think is kind of staring us in the face is the Torah seems to be spending a lot of words on describing the land as being a great land. Why is it important to come and say the land that you are about to go into, it's a land of milk and honey. It's a land that... It's a land that is a land of the seven species, of wheat, of barley, of grain, of this, of, of honey, of, of figs, of caribs. It, it goes on and on. you got six or seven verses here describing how wonderful the land is. They're, they're about to go in. A few days or a few weeks after these words are going to be said, they're going to see all of this. They, 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 they are going to see all this with their own eyes. Why is the Torah spending so much time describing it? So, and, and one more thing. If we look again at verse 12, chapter 11, verse 12, I want to focus on this verse because this, I think, is the more interesting midrash. Let's read it again. It is a land which Hashem your God looks after. On which Hashem your God always keeps His eye from year's beginning to year's end. There's a very difficult theological question here. Yes, Ron. Well, uh, it struck me before, God's eyes are always upon it. Does that imply that God's eyes aren't always upon Canada. Uh, yeah, you know, like... There you go. Stop. Stop. That's the question. That, that is the... It, it, the, the question... The, 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 the verse is begging that question. Right? What do you mean? What? Is the verse trying to imply that God's eye, whatever that means, is not upon other lands? What does that mean? Right? What does that mean? That we, do, do we not believe that God is everywhere in whatever way we mean that? That God's awareness covers all, encompasses all life, all the whole universe, all continents, all countries, all people? 
Like this verse is almost like it's taunting us to ask that question. Okay. We're now ready for, for the Medrash. This is a very difficult question. I agree. It is a very difficult question. And again, and, and again, Right. Okay. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's look at the Midrash. So the first Midrash is about the first few verses that we read. But, and, and the question that I think it's trying to answer here is why is it, if you were to look at the verses, it keeps on saying, the land, the land, the land. It emphasizes again and again this phrase, the land that you are about to cross into. It's a land of milk and honey. It's the land of, uh, the, the, of, of uh, wheat and barley. It's the wa- land. B- 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 over and over and over and over again. Says the Midrash, but the land with, w- that you are crossing to inherit, it is a land of mountains and plains. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, Twelve lands were given to Israel, corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel. And the flavor of the fruits of one land were not similar to that of each of the others. And these are the twelve lands. And it goes and he quotes twelve different phrases that are said in these verses... 12 different v- phrases of the land. A land of olive oil and honey. I shall bring him to the land whence he came. The land that you are crossing to inherit. A land of mountains and plains. A land which Hashem your God inquires after. For Hashem your God is bringing you to a good land. A land of streams of water. A land of wheat of bar- and barley. A land of olive oil and honey. A land where not, where not in constraint shall you eat bread. A land whose stones are iron. For the good land. Twelve lands corresponding to twelve tribes. So let's first start from a purely like text commentary perspective. Okay? The Medrash Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai identified that there is an overemphasis or over, there's an overuse okay, of the phrase land in these verses. And he counted and he found that it appears 12 times. And this is a thematic number, 12. Okay, the, the term land in these descriptions is described 12 times. What a coincidence! Maybe this is a hint or this is trying this from this we can learn that there are 12 different aspects to connecting to the land 12 different characteristics and from here we could see how it's a very easy jump to um, or a very easy kind of trend you know transferring that 12 uses of the word land 12 characteristics or 12 uses of the word land 12 tribes of Israel there you go from here we can come and say this you know, an idea that, as he said beforehand, um, 12 lands were given to Israel corresponding to 12 tribes. Each tribe is given a part of the land which is unique to them. And the flavor of the fruits of each one of those 12 lands is slightly different. So from a commentary perspective, we understand what Rabbi Shem Ben Yochai did. Okay, um, and I think it's also very easy to understand what he's trying to do here. Like, how do you say what is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai trying to do here? I'm sorry. We have more tribes as well. Why? And plus, because uh, Joseph. You're right. So when he sells 12 tribes, who is he not counting? And actually, maybe, maybe. Correct. Shimon didn't get. Shimon did. No, you're right and you're wrong. 
Shimon did not get a distinct, um, a distinct region of the land, but it, but Shimon did get cities and areas within the tribe of Judah, Yehuda. Levi, you're correct. They did not get land that they're supposed to that that is their land. Um, they got the cities, the uh, the cities, the Levite cities. But I, I think what the Medrash here is doing, it's a very, very beautiful idea. It's saying the land of Israel is not just being given to the Jewish people. Individual, there's, there's such a thing as individual connections to the land of Israel. And, and, and the relationship and the connection of the tribe of Zvulun to the land is different and the connection of the tribe of, of Menashe to the land. Saying the land is not just being given to the, whole, to the Jewish people as a whole. It's being given to the individual tribes, and the fruits and the, and the apple trees uh, that are going to grow in the land of Binyamin are, are different. Why? Because it's Binyamin's trees. And, it's, it, and this is not a case where this is a, it's solidly in the verses. Okay? It is not something that, can be, that is being proven. This is, it's, I think it's very clear what he's trying to do here. Yes, yeah, so Oleg. Like. Uh, I, I just have a question. So, uh, Rabbi, it, it looks like this emphasis on tribes everywhere. Uh, you, you may think it, it's a good thing. Uh, the tribes, the individual connections, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's all it's made for you basically. When, we, but uh, the fact that that people were divided into tribes later uh, resulted in the defeat of Jewish people, and that's what brought them down. In when they left uh, left Egypt, they were said, "You are a nation," and then uh, and so you you. Uh, you go together, uh, you, uh, you do everything together, you obey uh, the rules uh, together. And then the separation into tribes is sort of a counterintuitive. Like, why do we need to separate it? And why do we need to, uh, like, even from a perspective of like, uh, social economic uh, conditions, if, if, this, if we take this midrash as, uh, as given, one, one land is rich on uh, uh, stone and uh, uh, on iron and copper. Another one in deep wheat. So you you set up so, sort of set it up so that uh, they, they must work together to to survive. So it's not one of them is not uh, fully independent. So why create this uh, separation uh, in the first place? So you're assuming that the Torah is creating or mandating this separation. I would argue it's exactly the opposite. The distinction between the tribes was a fact, meaning they were different, we have to remember where they come from. They developed organically from actual individuals that grew slowly. And it, meaning, and it seems that they were identified within themselves as being belonging to distinct groups. Um, now, you could come and say, why does the Torah try to get rid of that? And say, okay, yes, 200 or 300 years ago, you all you know, originated, you all originated from one person, and you all originated from a different brother. But come on, it's been, it's been eight generations, ten generations, and, you know... So what if your great-great-great-grandfather was the same great-great-grandfather that he had? We're now one big people, and let's get rid of all these divisions. So my, my personal opinion of that would be, let's try to think back, not so far, along, not so far back, how successful, you know, what has happened to, to, um, to, maybe this is the wrong word to use, regimes, or attempts to erase um, group ident identities. There have been many, many attempts. 
coming from a positive ideal, there have been many, many attempts to come and say, okay, there is a, an ideal which very possibly is a good, is, is a positive ideal, a, a constructive one, and in the name of attaining that ideal, we should erase the divisions so everyone could together be part of this new ideal. And as we know from the 21st century, from the 20th century, that an, an attempt to um, artificially erase cultural di- a collective cultural distinctions is a very dangerous thing. I will, I, would, I will agree, and I will say, that I think that eventually it happens on its own. So for instance, okay, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll prove this, and then we just, uh, um, we just, I wouldn't use the word celebrated, but uh, we just, uh, the, the, there is a Jewish holiday which is a bit forgotten, but it's not a formal holiday, which is Tu Be'av, the 15th day of Av, which took place two or three days ago which was many, many years ago, was, a, was a, an official festive day. It wasn't a, um, a holiday that, uh, like uh, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, where you weren't allowed to do a melacha, but it was a festive day. Um, and one of the reasons that caused it to be considered a festive day in which you don't mourn and you don't do things like that is because it was a day that the tribes were officially allowed to marry within each other. And that was a day that, the, that officially, from a, from a legal standpoint, the barriers that, uh, between the tribes was, were dropped. But it happened in a very, very late... It happened um, approximately, uh, I don't know, a few hundred years after, the, after we entered the land of Israel. And Galina, I know you want to say something, but I just want to point out one more thing. So I'd say one thing is, is that I think that the Torah was accepting a reality which already existed. There was, the, 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 the nation was not a nation, it was first of all a collection of tribes. And the Torah accepts that as a reality and does not try to deny, deny and try to artificially try to, uh, it recognizes the, the fact that, that there is such a thing as collective identities and that there is a value to collective identities, I agree. There also are, 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 are negatives to it. And the last thing I'll say is I think that the Torah sees it as in the process of creating a unified people, it's almost like a child who has different forces within it and that, and that um, or sorry, within a family. You have one kid who everyone knows this kid is better at singing. This kid is better at math. This kid, and, and you don't try to erase them and say, okay, the kid who's good at math, we're going to say, okay, you have to be, you know, practice as many hours as him. We try to create a, a unified family by, by allowing each child to experience and to practice and to kind of uh, experience to the fullest those things that make him unique. And you hope that you're able to, con- to, to, to keep the, unity of the family by recognizing each one's talent. I agree with you that that didn't always work. And sometimes you have tensions within the family, and sometimes you have tensions um, within the nation. But I th- that's, that's how I understand it. Yes, Galina. It is, I, I, of, of, of course I agree with you, but, um, but, in this, but in this case I'd say what Oleg said before is a good, uh, is a good counter-argument. At the end of the day, you know, our history was filled, or not filled, there were quite a few times throughout the Jewish history where those differences caused destruction. So I'd say, 
Yes, there were times though that it worked well, and other times that it worked not as well. But that's, I agree with you that that's part of the challenge. Okay, I want to go to the second Midrash, which I find to be mesmerizing. And I think it gives an opposite approach. And I think it gives one which is very, very, very relevant for today. And we're going to get a little, I'm going to give my political disclaimer. Okay? And this goes to uh, Ron's question of the verse that seems to say what? God doesn't have his eye, whatever that means, on all the lands? Says the Medrash, A land which Hashem, your God, inquires after. Rebbe says, does he not? Does he inquire after it alone? Does he not inquire after all the lands? And then he brings a quote to prove that God looks after all the lands. A, a verse from Job. He makes it rain upon the land with there is no person. You see? Even with I know people. Everywhere. So the Midrash goes on to say, by the way, I find the question to be a great question because it's very rational. Saying, oh, come, in, come on, like God is supposed to be omnipotent, omnipresent. So what do you mean he looks over only this land? What kind of statement is that? What is the intent then of a land which Hashem, your God, inquires after? It is as if he inquires only after it. Because he inquires after it, he inquires after all the other lands along with it. Let's continue. Similarly, behold, he neither slumbers or sleeps the watcher of Israel. Is it Israel alone that he watches? Does he not watch over all? I mean, these are the classic, classic questions about how we understand God's unique relationship with the Jewish people. What does that mean, God's unique relationship with the Jewish people? What does that mean, his unique, what, God is the God who created everything and everyone. I mean, right, we believe that. So what does it mean he has a unique relationship with us? So let's continue, right? Does he not watch over all? As it is written, in his hand is the soul of every living thing and the spirit of all the flesh of man. What is the intent then of the watcher of Israel? It is as, so the answer that the Midrash gives it is as if he watches only over Israel. And because of that watching, he watches over all along with them. Similarly, and my eyes and my heart shall be there in the temple all of the days. Now are they, now are they there alone? Is it not written, they are the eyes of Hashem which range over all the world? And in every place the eyes of Hashem look upon the evil and the good? What then is the intent of, and my eyes and my heart shall be there all of the days, shall be there all of the days? It is as if they are only there, and because they are there, they are everywhere. Okay, thoughts, questions, thoughts. What is this midras trying to say? What is it doing? What is, what is it doing? What is it saying? What does it mean? What is it? Thoughts. I have two, I have two perspectives. One, it's a wonderful rationalization. Uh, as one, you know, uh, so that's one side. But on the other hand, maybe Israel is... Wait, wait, what do, what do you mean? Wait, 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 explain. What do you mean by that? Well, we, we know by definition that God is not just looking after, looking, only has eyes for Israel. Uh, and uh, so if you want to rationalize that statement, he's, he's uh, looks at, at, through Israel to all the rest of the world. Uh, so you're saying it's but basically a way, a way to make us feel better. It's like, look, you're special. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like when a parent, you know, goes to the little kid and says, uh, you know, and just gives them some extra attention, making sure they feel that they are special. Is that what you're trying okay. to say? No, the rationalization is if I go to one child, a sporting event, but I don't go to the other child's singing event. I'm saying, well, when I'm at the sporting event, I'm still looking, thinking about you in your singing event. Okay. Rationalizing the person, the child still feels, the, the, you know, but maybe there's another way of looking at it, which is that 
that uh, saying if Israel is a portal to the rest of the world, then maybe uh, God saying that by you know through the temple or that He's able to see the rest of the world through Israel, or how they deal with Israel. I I agree. I think that's exactly what the Midrash is saying, and I agree. I agree exactly with both of those points. It could be understood on like the psychological level. Okay, the psychological level of you guys are special, but really the father goes to every kid and says to him, you are special to me. Right? And makes every kid feel that when I'm looking at you, I'm looking only at you. That's, I'd say, I'd say like the simple level that it could be understood, but I agree with you 100% that I think that the Midrash is trying to do more than that. And I think it's trying to come and say that it's trying to come and give us a perspective of the Jewish people are a portal for the rest of the world. They are the prism through which God governs the world, and uh, and the land of Israel is the. And I and I and I know that I'm saying a word here that is very ambiguous, or very uh, uh, not ambiguous, amorphous, and that the land of Israel is the portal through which um, God sees or connects or relates to the land. Now I know that. Those are difficult phrases. But I want to add one more thing of what I think, uh, um, uh, one more aspect to it. What it's doing here, we usually have, I know that a lot of times, and here I'm going to get a little political, we have a sense that our relationship to the way we view Ju- Judea- Jewish peoplehood and the way in which we view the land of Israel sometimes sounds to some people and sometimes even to me all too similar to a, 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 a any other right-wing national, nationalistic you know, person somewhere in the world. We're the best, you know, uh, our land is for us, it's, no one, it's, it's, it's for no one else. And these are very hot topic political issues. And you guys know that I usually try to stay away, so I'm not going to get too explicit. And on the, on the first Midrash that we saw seems to be focusing on, not only, not only, not only does, does, the, does uh, uh, is the land of Israel belong to the Jewish people, but even each tribe has their own little land. It seems to me like, like, like Oleg was saying, very, very chauvinistic, very nationalistic, very, div, div, uh, very ex- uh, exclusionary. But then comes this Midrash and does exactly the opposite. It's saying, Jews, understand, yes, you are special, your land is special, etc., etc. But understand that the land that God is giving you, when God is looking at you, He's looking at you as a representative of the of representative of the world. This is not just a way to make us feel us to feel great. This puts a burden on us when God is looking at the land of Israel. The Midrash is saying. He's looking at the world. Whether, however, however it is we want to understand whether this fits in the verses or not, what Chazal is doing here is amazing. They're saying, your land is your land. But understand that your land is the portal to God's connection to the entire land. And your city is a city through which the entire world is going to connect to the divine. And that comes and says, yes, it is our land, but it is our land not as an exclusionary, not in, not, not in order to exclude, but in order to serve. Now, just because our land and our city are there to serve the world doesn't mean that we don't have our own unique relationship with it. 
that we need to maintain. But it's turning here, it's, 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 it's a universal nationalism. That's what it's presenting here. And the truth is, that is the kind of the main theme of Jewish nation of, of Jewish nation nationhood from the very beginning. Right? When Hashem says to Avram Avinu, go from your father's home, go from your land to a land which I will show you, I'm gonna give you a land. Separate yourself from the world. For what purpose? So the whole world will be blessed. So whenever we hear these discussions and these debates, our Jewish nationhood, peoplehood, and nationality, its purpose is a very different one than when you hear about other nations and other people talking about, you know, nationality and nationalism. Ours is a nationalism, is a universal nationalism. We are egotistical about our land and our nation and our identity for the purpose of bettering the entire world. Not by conquering them, and not by letting them conquer us or overrun us, but by being true to who we are, we understand that this serves the entire world in a, in a myriad of ways. Through diplomatic relations and through modeling behavior and creating a, 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 creating a, 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 a striving and hopefully building a utopian society, etc., etc., So, whether we understand, want to understand this as a theological midrash, which is more difficult. I, I do believe it could be understood as a theological concept, but it's a much more difficult one that I'm not sure I myself understand as, uh, could understand it. But as a moral and even, even a political, I, th- I think this should be read as a political midrash that tries to understand... We, it is our land, it is our unique land and nation, and it should be seen as unique for us. But its purpose is to serve the world. It is a way through, we need to understand it as a way through through which Hashem will connect to the world through all kinds of ways. Some are easier to understand and some are difficult to understand. But understand what God says, He's looking at you in order to connect to the world that does not put a sense of privilege into, the, into these verses. It puts a sense of responsibility. Yes, uh, Ran, Oleg, and then uh, Batya. We'll just, uh, we'll do it clockwise. Or, or counterclockwise, sorry, yes. I believe that it is more a theological subject than otherwise. And I believe in what you said, what you said about the individual connection. I'm referring to the pasuk, which is difficult, no? The pasuk uh, about uh, the land that is uh, uh, supervised by Hashem uh, from the beginning till the end of the year. The interesting, interesting thing in this pasuk is that Hashem elokecha. It's not God, your God, not in plural, but in singular. So, twice. Eres asher Hashem elokecha dore shota tamid, einei Hashem elokecha ba, mi reshit hashanah v'acheretana. So it's twice. I believe there is here uh, a, a way to accentuate the intensity. You know, they see, so, Hashem will supervise your land, but and will go. Agreed. If a human, in a theological way, is ready to go farther, well, exactly, the answer will be uh, equal from the other side. Right. I, I agree. I agree. I think it, Hashem uh, Elohecha, that, repet- that repetition emphasizes that. Oleg, you were... You were no, I, I actually just had a question. So what you described, it, it's very ambiguous uh, in, in the sense uh, you know, the portal, and, but what exactly does it mean? Well, in, in a sense that, that, so, no, that, that's, that, that's what I said. When I said the word portal, Ron said it and I agreed with him. I do think 
that the Midrash is trying, that's what I call, that's what I call the theological reading of this Midrash. But I'm telling you the truth, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure, I do think that they mean this literally, but I'm not sure I can understand, I, I, I fully understand what that means. But I do think they also mean it in, as, a, as a political reading. And, and I, hope, I hope you guys, I, 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 hope, I hope I'm explaining myself um, um, enough. I think this could be read as a theological midrash, but I think this midrash could also be read and understood as a political midrash, as a moral and a political one, which I think is a lot easier to understand. Reading, is, reading it as a theological midrash I think is possible, but I'm not sure what it means by that. I think that this idea of the Jewish people as a portal to the world, to the rest of the world, is one which I can understand a little bit. I'll give you an example, okay? That the Jewish people as a distinct entity has been, has been, um, has been, can be, tra- we can trail it as a distinct entity and uh, uh, as a distinct um, group of people that have been at the center, or near the center, at the center of human history since we've, re- since we've been able to record human history, and we can trail the effect, the affect and the effect that the Jewish collective have had on the world, and the transformation that the world has gone through, through through the events of the Jewish people, through the history of the Jewish people, through the, through, the, through the Torah and Tanakh, which the Jewish people have given the world, that is a good way, an easy, a fairly easy way to understand the concept of what we call the portal, of through the relationship of God, of Hashem, to the Jewish people, Hashem connects to the world. Okay? But, yeah. I had a question uh, as, 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 um, as, as a thought experiment. Uh, so we'll say so it's it's a duty uh, stolen on Jewish people to represent the humankind, basically, uh, and therefore to obey the rules and commandments and, and behave in an exemplary way, so show, showing the way for other people, basically, so that the other people would look upon Jews and go, uh, will uh, change their ways to the better ones. So the, the question is that uh, if you follow the same like lo- uh, this logic, then it would be uh, it would you could easily assume that the goal is then to go and spread the the the, the right way of living unto other nations. But it it is not part of the Jewish tradition to be uh, to be missionary. Right. And that. Uh, to actually go and and try to convert people in into their own way, uh, right? Meaning, like convert them in the in the right way, so that uh, uh, the the higher purpose would uh, be achieved in in short period of time. Um, I don't think necessarily. Um, well, I agree with you that we definitely that that Judaism definitely does not believe in proselytizing or missionizing. Not at all. Um, I think it does believe in missionizing about human morality, but not about religious practice. Um, now, just because, in, in order for me to 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 have an effect on you, doesn't mean that you have to em, emulate everything that I'm doing. In order for me to to have a uh, um, uh, uh, having a, affecting someone else to change the behavior doesn't mean copying them, right? I could be a fantastic uh, orator and speaker, and through the my my the fact that I can explain things or I can be pa- passionate or charismatic. I can cause a person to want to become better. It doesn't mean that they, that in order to become better, they need to be like me and become a charismatic orator. Let's say, the things do not. I do. I do think. I do agree with you that the things that 
that I think the nations are are supposed to learn and emulate the Jewish people has to do with the moral structure of society. And that I think we do believe in actively spreading. And, the, and, and, and Torah does teach that all human beings are commanded in you know, basic morality. Not to steal, not to, not to murder, not to, uh, you know, certain basic things that have to do with morality. And that every society needs to set, one of the seven Noahide laws is that every society needs to set up the rule of law in order, to, in order for there to be, in order for there to be, uh, you know, order and the society will be able to function in a positive way. It doesn't mandate how that should be done. Because for the Jewish people, there's a very specific set of rules and laws that for our character, fit with our character, for us to be, to, to function positively as a society. But different societies are different. Not all the rules and laws that would maintain my family's, for instance, my family has certain, my actual family, my family of six people have certain customs and certain rules and laws about how many, I don't know, about what, about, uh, you know, what you do when you come home from school and what you, some of them are arbitrary, some of them have to do with what I know my kids are better at. We have certain rules in our house and if, and if you come and look at my house and say, wow, your fa- let's say, it doesn't, but let's say, wow, your family functions so well, so I'm going to copy all the things that you do. But but it might be it might you might if you copy all the things that I do your family might fall apart because your kids are different your dynamic is different your character is different your family dynamics and therefore Torah the, the Torah definitely does believe in the concept of just like we said about the different tribes different nations different nations different characters different things that are appropriate not appropriate morality morality is morality but. Other structures of society and rules and laws, each society needs to decide for itself in order to find the way for the society to function. Yeah, Ron. What you said I found elegant and I liked it. However, we started off with the land of Israel. Then you switched it to the Jewish people who are all over the world. Uh, so, yes. I, I didn't do it. The, the, Wait, I didn't do it. The Midrash did. Well, well, it was talking about the land of Israel. You're right. And then it said, and then the Midrash said, similarly, behold, he neither slumbers nor or sleeps, the watcher of Israel. The Midrash is the one who says, listen, he starts from the land. He says, you know what? That same concept, we find it also when it comes to the people of Israel. And we also find it about the city of Jerusalem. And by the way, all three of these things are constantly hot topic, you know, political hot topics. Jerusalem as the Jewish city, the Jewish capital. Israel, the land of Israel as the Jewish land. And the, and the distinctness, distinctiveness of the Jewish people as a distinct people. The Medrash is the one who, who says... Oh, just like this is true about the land, it's true about the people, and it's true about the city. So you're saying that if wherever Jews go, God has his eye over not just the land of Israel, so the Jews all over the world, and we've been dispersed all over the world. Uh, is, that, is, 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 the, is, the, is there any better way to explain the sustainability of the Jewish people in exile for the last 2,000 years? Because God has his eye over us? Yes, there's a unique relationship there. And through that unique relationship, including through the disbursement and through the exile of the Jewish people all over the world, even through that the world has been transformed and has been affected. Sure. By the fact that Jews have reached everywhere, even through their suffering. Okay. I found this midrash. The truth is, the midrash on this parsha is just filled with this stuff. And again, in these things, like rabbis of a thousand seven hundred years ago, were, were were balancing this very. It's it's a very. I think. Excuse the phrase. It's almost like I'm embarrassed to say it. In a very very, 
very, very sophisticated balance they're creating here between particularism and universalism, between nationalism and, and, univers and, and, and universalism, and trying to create a very unique type of, of particular identity for the Jewish people. I find it to be mesmerizing and something that is still today so needed and so needed to understand these two sides of Jewish national of of Jewish statehood of Jewish sovereignty of Jewish of a relation of how we talk about Israel how we talk about 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 uh, about um, you know Jewish peoplehood and ethnicity. I find it to be so sophisticated that even today so many people you know, uh, would have difficulty accepting this two-sided, you know, we need to be who we are for the purpose of everyone. We need to have, we need to look out for our land for the purpose of everyone. Okay? And with that, Shavua Tov. Thank you very much. Uh, Oleg, Oleg, when, 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 when are you coming?